This is going to go over the diversity of fungi in brief. So just to remind you, fungi are not closely related to plants, but sometimes we do talk about them together because they both colonized land prior to animals. In fact, they were integral for animals being able to even colonize land because they created habitats and food sources and uh, decomposer system, um, the plants and animals, or plants and fungi together. What you'll see here, fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants. Remember, fungi and animals are in this Unaconta supergroup and and, and specifically in the Pithsacont um, uh, subclade there, and then the plants are up here in the Archaeoplastida. They're in a different supergroup. So the kind of things I want you to focus on are understanding um, the nutritional mode, the habitat and the structural features of fungi, the life cycles, which is a little different than any life cycle you've probably seen before, so take a close look at that. Uh, economical and ecological roles of fungi, and then uh, just something about um, how lichens are constructed and their general characteristics. You also need to know the groups of fungi and their basic characteristics as well. So just to remind you, fungi are not just mushrooms, even though frequently that's what we think about primarily. Uh, mushrooms are just actually a small part of the body of the entire fungus. And that's only one type of fungus that makes a mushroom in a classic way that we think of um, uh, eating other organisms. But um, unlike animals, they are what we call absorptive heterotrophs or absorptive chemoheterotrophs. So what this means is that they secrete enzymes externally and they digest their food outside their body and then incorporate or um, uh, take into their cells the digested food so mostly monomers and small molecules that then they use inside their cells for both cellular respiration as well as building molecules. So if you think about the external digestion, you know, if you know anything that's moldy, usually it's pretty mushy. And part of the reason for that is because of that external digestion of that um, tissue that the fungus is going to absorb. They live in dark, moist areas. So both the fungi, you know, that you find uh, after floods, so it's one of the reasons you have to be really careful about molds then is because of the wetness that promotes fungal growth. You'll see mushrooms pop up, which are just a part of the fungus that lives underground all the time. But you'll see the pop-up of mushrooms happening um, after uh, it rains frequently. And a lot of that's because the spores the, will not grow into new fungi unless it's moist. You'll also see fungal infections in moist areas like um, yeast infections in the vaginal canal, uh, you'll have jock itch, which is in the, the uh, groin area, so that's pretty moist there. Um, thrush in the mouth, the yeast infection in the mouth. Um, so those all tend to be moist areas. Athlete's foot grows in um, locker rooms where there's shower and steam. And so you see that's where fungus is primarily found. If we look at the body structure, the mushroom is the part we see, and not all fungi have mushrooms. Um, but that's a very small portion of the body. Most of the bodies are located underground and uh, it's made of hyphae, which are these little filaments. So this is a hyphae, or hypha is singular. Um, and all those filaments together forms the mycelium. So it's this branched network of all the hyphae together. And the mycelium is highly adaptive it, um, and the hyphal structure. So you can see that they have a lot of surface area, the branching, not a lot of volume. So what that means is that they can do a lot of absorption of um, the externally digested food particles, the uh, water and minerals. They can absorb those very effectively without having to provide the um, uh, hyphae itself with a lot of nutrients because there's not a lot of cell volume. So it uh, can also grow through food because it's this you know, um, network. And so if they can actually digest the food from the inside as well as the outside, um, so that's also advantageous. But the uh, high surface area really allows for a lot of absorption. The fungus's um, reproductive structure in this case is a mushroom here. And the spores will be produced underneath the mushroom and the gills. Um, other types of fungi have different reproductive structures that also produce spores. With the um, reproductive cycle of fungi, it's kind of um, perhaps odd compared to everything you've seen prior to this, uh, it has two possibilities. So most fungi can undergo both asexual reproductive cycle or under different conditions, the sexual reproductive cycle. 
So asexual reproduction, the mycelium you start with, that's a fungus, and the new mycelium you end with, the new fungus, are going to be genetically identical. They're clones. It's asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, the mycelium you start with and the new mycelium, mycelia that you end with are going to all be genetically different. So you've introduced variation into the population. Asexual reproduction, the mycelium, the whole thing is haploid. So you're going from a haploid mycelium to a haploid spore producing structure to haploid spores back to a haploid mycelium. So every time you're going to go from N to N to N to N. And so that means all these transitions here are mitosis, uh, mitotic events. On the other hand, sexual reproduction, which would be triggered um, by usually stress, stressful events externally, um, and that's adaptive because uh, the more variation in the population, the more likely that at least some members of the population can survive a stressful event. So you have a haploid mycelium, so you have two of them that come together, and those cells fuse, the hyphae fuse. So that's the marriage, the agamy, of the plasma, the cytoplasm. So the plasmogamy is the fusion of the two cells. Those cells both have haploid nuclei, and those haploid nuclei stay haploid and stay separate. So that's why this is called the heterokaryotic stage. So karyotic meaning um, chromosomes, so karyotype. Hetero meaning um, um, two or opposites. So you're going to have the heterokaryotic, which means it has separate um, nuclei that are all haploid. You can have two nuclei and be dikaryotic in a cell. Um, they can have multiple nuclei and just be heterokaryotic, and so we'll just call it heterokaryotic to um, incorporate all those different types of situations. So the mushroom or the fungus can exist in a heterokaryotic state for a very long period of time. We're talking like years. And um, until an external trigger happens and those nuclei fuse together. So two nuclei will fuse in karyogamy, the marriage of the karyos, the um, nuclei, and make zygotes. So each zygote's diploid. So now it is going to um, make spores. So you'll notice the fungi never under, uh, they never produce gametes. There's no gametes, no fertilization in uh, fungi. There's only spores. Spores and mycelia. There is a zygote. That zygote is going to make spores. So it's a single cell. It needs to make other cells, which means, um, and spores are always haploid. So if you go from a diploid zygote to a haploid spore, that's having the amount of DNA, which means that's a meiotic event. So it's meiosis from a zygote to a spore. All those spores are going to be different because meiosis um, generates variation between the resulting cells. Those spores, if they land on the correct area or the favorable area when they are dispersed, can grow back up into new mycelia that are all different from each other through mitosis because it's haploid to haploid. So that's the asexual reproductive cycle and the sexual reproductive cycle of fungi. This is generalized. Each group has some specifics that are um, uh, variations on the theme of this generalized cycle. But for our purposes right now, this generalized cycle is the most important to understand. You might have heard these general terms in daily life. So just to review, mold and yeast are both just, they're not a type of fungus. It's like a general class of fungal shapes. So molds um, are frequently, you see them as like sort of carpets or sort of maybe sort of fuzzy. Um, they're basically a general name for anything that asexually reproduces using spores, any fungus. Yeasts are single-celled fungi that uh, also reproduce asexually. They, they undergo um, budding where part of the cell, well, mitosis occurs and then there's two cells from that single cell and each one is its new yeast organism. Um, fungi have um, three main roles in the uh, ecology and ecosystems. So the one that's the most classic is the decomposer role. And so its job here is to get, um, so primary producers um, capture sunlight and make food in themselves. And then we have a chain of organisms that eat each other to get carbon. And the question though is how do you get the carbon back out of these organisms, like especially quaternary consumers, let's say nothing eats the hawk 
in this chain, how would you get the carbon back out of that hawk, its body? And the answer here is the decomposer. So fungi and bacteria are the two um, classic decomposers. So they're going to break down dead material to um, release the carbon compounds as well as the nitrogen and phosphorus and all that stuff back into the ecosystem. So they would be the link that takes the carnivore back um, down to molecules that can then be incorporated back into the plant and then go through the cycle. So here's where our um, microorganisms and other detritivores, that are the microorganisms, those are the decomposers. So that's what you'd want to know here. Um, they eat detritus, which is um, the dead material. They also actually um, can be parasitic and eat live material too, and we'll talk about that in a second. So to look further at some of the different element cycles in um, ecosystems on Earth, so the carbon cycle, so how do animals get the carbon? They eat the plants, um, but then at the end, the decomposition, fungi play a role in that decomposition of the living organisms um, to put the, some more of the carbon back into the atmosphere because the fungi do cellular respiration, release that back to the atmosphere, can be reincorporated into plants and then keep on getting transferred from organism to organism. The nitrogen, fungi are really important um, in the decomposition to help release nitrogen. Um, so you can see here, so they're decomposers and bacteria have to play a role to get the nitrogen into the form that plants can use. But you need to be able to break down the dead organisms in order to um, get that nitrogen out in some form that then the, the bacteria can convert and then the plants can take back up. And then the rest of the organisms get their nitrogen by eating plants or eating other organisms that have eaten plants. The phosphorus, you can see the fungi in this role here, another decomposer, and so um, the, the uh, fungus decomposes the, organ the dead organisms, releases that um, phosphorus back into the environment, which can then be taken up by the plant when it's in certain forms, and um, the fungus actually helps it do that and then the other organisms can eat it and get phosphorus from the plant or from an organism that ate a plant. So besides being a um, decomposer, fungi can also be symbionts, and there's a you know, parasitic symbiont is one role. So these are going to be uh, fungi that cause disease and damage other organisms, so it's a positive-negative relationship. Most of uh, fungal infections are actually plant infections, so about 30,000 species of fungi um, are parasites on plants. And um, most of plant disease, you can see 80% to 90% of plant disease is actually caused by fungi. So we lose billions and billions of dollars of plants, crops and such, to fungus every year. So it's a big deal um, economically for humans, actually, um, that that occurs. So here are some examples of those types of infections. We have the ergots, or ergets. They are um, a claviceps is the genus of the fungus. Um, that's the little brown part here. And they infect um, a number of grains, but primarily rye is what we think of. They produce lysergenic acid, which is the same compound um, primarily composing LSD, the street drug. And so if you um, ingest rye that has the ergets in it, then you can um, uh, have hallucinations and become very sick. Sometimes you could die, uh, convulsions, that kind of thing. And so it becomes really important to screen the um, rye crops for the ergets to make sure that um, nobody gets sick from eating them. Um, here's some tar spots. So that's a fungal infection on sycamore. You might have seen that before. Corn smut, which can be eaten, but it does destroy the corn. So that's a fungal infection. Um, and so different types of rusts, we see wheat rust in lab, so that's another type of infection. Rust can um, destroy plants as well. We have uh, major wipeouts from fungal infections. For example, the um, English elms in Europe and most of North America are completely gone. And so there's a disease, it's a fungal infection called Dutch elm disease, and it will kill the, the, the tree. And because the plants that were planted in um, America and, and Europe were mostly clonal, so they were all the same genetically, when the fungus struck, it wiped them all out, and Europe doesn't have any more of these um, English elms 
there. The fungus is not in Australia, so you can see that those plants are fine, but you know that would be something you'd really be worried about getting transferred to Australia because then it could easily wipe out all their trees as well. Parasitic symbionts can also um, be in the context of fungi infecting animals. So we call any fungal infection a mycosis. So myco usually means fungus. And um, here's some examples of those. So ringworm, which is not a worm, just forms a sort of looks like a rash that's a worm sort of round thing um, on your skin. It's also called jock itch. And so that's a fungal infection. Athlete's foot is a fungal infection. Um, vaginal yeast infections, as well as thrush, which is a yeast infection in the mouth. It's one you see in babies a lot. Um, certain types of lung diseases, um, you can inhale the spores. Like that's why you have to be really careful about certain mold types that get in your vents. So if you inhale the spores, you can get really sick because the fungus can start growing in your lungs. Besides the parasitic symbionts, we also have mutualistic symbionts. So this is a plus-plus relationship. And the classic one is the mycorrhizae. So the, we've, um, we see this between fungi and plant roots. So here's the plant roots, cells, and here's the fungus. And um, there's, uh, this is one way that the uh, relationship can work, is that the fungus um, grows through the cell wall and into the um, plant cell. It doesn't actually penetrate the cell membrane. You can see that's in this orange color here. But it does have, it's in its cytoplasm. So there's nutrient exchange going across the um, cell membranes between the plant, which is providing the fungus with sugars from its photosynthesis, and the fungus, which is providing the plant with phosphorus and some additional water um, from its absorptive processes. So that would be the mutualistic mycorrhizae there. The ones that are actually inside the cells are called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So this is an arbuscle here, sort of like a little tree. So those are the ones that actually are inside the cells. And um, But there's also ectomycorrhizal fungi that actually just grows between the plant cells. And so the um, nutrient exchange and the mineral and water exchange has to happen across the cell wall as well. But both of those will work. And so both of these, this would be um, a root, a plant root here, and a plant root there, and the fungus is in the purple. We also have mutualistic symbionts called endophytes. Um, so this is a picture here of GFP producing um, fungus. So all the green you see here is, is the fungus, and then the rest of it's the plant. So this is actually inside of a leaf, a plant leaf. And so um, these can be... These endophytes are helpful in multiple ways. And we know that when the endophyte is um, killed or not inoculated so that the plant doesn't have the endophyte, that doesn't grow very well. Same with plants that um, the mycorrhizae. If you put an antifungal on plants and get rid of all their, all their uh, mycorrhizal fungi, then a lot of times the plants will die or they just don't grow very well. Same with the endophytes. Um, another reason um, that they are useful besides just the growth, is also because they produce toxins that um, deter herbivory, and they can also defend against pathogen infections, and so protect the plant that way from getting eaten or um, diseases. Another mutualistic symbiont relationship is the lichen. So not lich, it's lichen. Uh, and that's between the fungi here in white and then the alg algae here in the green spheres, or could also be cyanobacteria. So the many, many different types of lichens, here's some examples um, of crustose lichen. So this um, kind of orange stuff here is, is, a, is a lichen as well as this orange and probably this white and um, maybe the, the gray as well. Those are all um, the fungal algal relationship. And it's the same kind of thing as the plant. So the algae produces or the cyanobacteria produces sugars that the fungi take and then the fungi provides those with um, uh, water and minerals that it has absorbed. So here's some other examples of foliose um, lichen and then here's a fruticose lichen so that's uh, that can be stringy uh, or these look sort of like leaves because they have almost like foliage but there's no plants involved in these. Um, 
Ecologically, they're important because they can um, form new soil from breaking down rocks. So you'd see them as pioneer species in recolonizing areas that have been damaged. Uh, they're also sensitive to air pollution, so that can be useful or economically as a gauge of an area if you see all the lichens go away. You might consider checking the air pollution to see if that's a problem, because that's frequently a sign of um, the lichens dying as a sign of the air pollution. We also have um, economic roles. So these would be not ecological now, but things that are benefiting humans monetarily. Uh, so the diseases we've already talked about, those all cost money to treat, um, also make money because doctors have to treat them. Um, fungi also can make antibiotics, like penicillin is from a fungus called penicillium. Other fungi um, have, an have antiviral compounds that they make that will kill viruses. So they're working on developing a lot of those antivirals because we don't have very many good antiviral drugs. And uh, it makes sense why, at least for the bacteria, the fungus would, would uh, produce compounds that kill bacteria, right? Because they're both decomposers. So they're both competing for the same food source. So if you can kill your competition, then you get the food. And so you can see that here, here's bacteria, Streptococcus aure or Staphylococcus aureus. And here is your penicillium mold, so that's the fungus, and you can see that it kills the um, uh, bacteria. And so it would win, over, uh, win out on eating that food there. We also use um, fungi to make our own food. So mushrooms, we eat them directly. Um, cheeses, like blue cheese and roquefort, are, um, the green stuff is fungus. Um, almost all cheese rinds, though, have fungus in them that they are used to give flavor to the, fung or to the cheese in different ways. Alcohol and bread are both made using yeast, which is a fungus. And so those are just some of the ways that we use the fungi. Uh, truffles are fungi. Um, it's very expensive truffle oil, as well as shaved truffles on food. Um, they're sort of like a type of mushroom, um, but very, very expensive. We also use yeast to do research. So they're good for um, biotechnology, as well as... Um, uh, using them to crystallize proteins and stuff to study protein structure. So we, we study them, study the yeast themselves, but we also use the yeast to grow stuff to study other organisms. We can also, actually, they're trying to make fabric using yeast um, and other types of fungi. So there's a video about that that you can watch. It's uh, quite interesting. So that's another eco economic role that's uh, arising. Um, we're looking at using fungi to break down the plants into cellulose, uh, to break down the plants into ethanol. So the way that we use biofuels is, in large degree, to make ethanol from plants. And that process is relatively inefficient and um, very difficult in some types of plants. So it's easy in things like corn, but that's not economically and ecologically a good idea. Uh, it costs more energy to do it than usually you get out of it. And it's a food source that we're destroying for energy rather than food for eating. Um, but you can use other plants that are, that are non-edible. They live in areas that other plants can't grow, um, but they're a little bit difficult to break down, cellulose. So um, they're trying to work with fungi to see if the fungi can break the cellulose down into ethanol. Um, and so that way it's much more efficient and um, we could get the ethanol out that way. Fungi are also used for bioremediation, so that's going to be like the bacteria, where they can help process sewage and clean that up. Um, they can use them to eat petroleum products, so they'll eat the hydrocarbon compounds in spills um, and you know contamination, and then it leaves it clean. And actually, they're like a establish a whole new ecosystem there because the fungi. Um, result in a clean environment and then you get growth of plants and colonization like that. So there's five different groups of fungi. You just need to know gen pretty general things about each of them. Um, they're mostly classified by their sexual reproductive structures uh, as well as some genetics. There might be actually in some of these groups I'm talking about there's probably they're not monophyletic so they have multiple clades within it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm just going to use these terms now, though, because this is the best understanding we have at the moment. So here are our fungi, and uh, nucleorids 
are the closest relatives. They are a protist, and they actually look a lot like this chytrid. It's said with a K sound. Chytrids are a type of fungi. And so this is all in the epithecons, and so the nucleorids are the closest relatives of fungi. So if we look at fossils, we can see them about 460 million years ago, probably earlier, but we are, aren't positive. Um, but here are, you can see the hyphae um, all over the place, so this nice fungal fossil. And um, we also see them with plants, frequently associated with plants in mycorrhizal relationships in the fossil record. So here's our chytrids. Then we have the zygomycetes, glomeromycetes, ascomycetes, and vasidiomycetes. For our purposes, you don't need to know this phylogeny. Um, you do need to know some of the other ones, but not the fungal one. You can see the, what I was talking about. So chytrids are probably multiple groups, and the zygomycetes are multiple groups. So it really doesn't nest quite like this. Um, but for now, we'll just talk about it in that context. Chytrids have um, flagellated spores, which is unusual, reminiscent of the nucleorids. They are the early, earliest lineage to diverge. They live in moist environments like lakes and ponds. And their most important feature for us is this fact that the amphibians are being killed in droves by chytrid infections. So there's a video that you need to watch about the decline of the amphibian species um, because of chytrid infection. It's from the California Academy of Sciences where they're doing research to try to understand it better. The zygomycetes, so you've seen this in lab, um, or you will see it in lab, they are the um, produced zygosporangia as their uh, sexual reproductive structure. The sporangium, these little parts here, that's their asexual reproductive structure. And examples of those are black bread mold. So a lot of times these are the ones that you'd see on your food. Most of the time those are going to be zygomycetes. Palobolus also has a video online and it'll show you, um, it has a very unusual way of, of uh, ejecting its spores to get them very far away. Palobolus is eaten by, uh, it grows on animal dung, a lot of times rabbit and cow dung. Um, and so it's actually the spores get eaten by the organism, then they get uh, uh, defecated when it um, releases feces, and then it grows on those feces, then it shoots the spores off onto new grass where that um, herbivore will come eat more, and then it goes through, and then it can grow up on the feces again, and so it has this life cycle. Um, and the further away that it can get um, distributed, which has this very interesting hydro, like water-powered mechanism for ejecting spores really far, um, the more likely it is that an organism is going to come by and eat it and distribute it in some new area where it can grow. So you want to take a look at those Palobolus videos. Then we have a glomeromycetes. Um, the important thing about this is that these are frequently the ones you see in mycorrhizae. So the ones at least that are, are buscule mycorrhizae, the ones that are inside the cells, those are almost, um, almost always glomeromycetes. Ascomycetes are named um, for, they're called sac fungi, so they're named for their ascus here, or ascus here, the ascocarp, the little sacs that contain the spores. So conidia fours and conidia, which are the spores, that's your asexual reproductive structure. The ascocarp with the asci and then the ascospores inside are your sexual reproductive structure. Um, a lot of them are what we call mushrooms, um, but these mushrooms are different than our classic like toadstool mushrooms. So morels, we can eat those. Those are in the ascomycete group, um, as well as uh, some types of yeast. So most of the yeasts are in the ascomycete group. A lot of the lichen symbionts are going to be there as well. So those are the sac fungi. And then basidiomycetes are the club fungi, and that's because of this little structure here, which is like a club, and that's the basidium. That's where the um, basidiospores are produced. There's four of those. That's the sexual reproductive structure. Those are released, and they will go grow up into new mycelia. Um, conidia and conidiophores are the asexual reproductive structures of basidiomycetes. So these are the classic mushrooms, are basidiomycetes. Um, they're important decomposers, um, and they are the ones, like most of the mushrooms that we eat, like portobello mushrooms and little white button mushrooms, um, those are all going to be basidiomycetes. So you can see here is a mushroom, and that's the reproductive structure of the basidiomycete. Um, and uh, you can see this fusion event here, you know, the fusion of the two hyphae, so that's plasmogamy. Here's a dikaryotic state. It's heterokaryotic state. So all the mushroom, if you were to 
um, look at a cell under the microscope, you'd actually see two nuclei per cell. Then um, in the gills, the basidia are there, and you get a fusion event, that's the karyogamy. So now you have these little zygotes, diploid nuclei, they undergo meiosis to form a bunch of new haploid nuclei that are all genetically varied. Those guys are going to end up um, producing, or they're going to be, they produce spores, and those spores are haploid, and then they go up and grow into new mycelia. So it's actually interesting. If you um, try to get rid of your mushrooms by cutting them like with your lawnmower, you're actually most of the time just distributing the spores more effectively. And so you'll have more mushrooms growing in your yard when the next rain comes. But mushrooms aren't necessarily bad. I mean, sometimes they're poisonous. Like you want glomera mycete fungi in your yard because they're the ones that do all the mycorrhizal relationships. So killing all the fungus in your yard is not a good idea. You'll actually probably kill most of your plants because they'll lose their symbiotic relationships. So, um, and these kind of um, fairy rings, uh, you might have seen these before. This is actually from a former student's backyard. And you can see that the mushrooms form in this circle. So these are, the actual fungus itself is mostly underground. And these are actually on the ring of the outside of the fungal body. So the fungus started growing in the middle of the ring and put up a couple mushrooms there in a the little clump. Then as it got bigger, it puts the mushrooms up at the end, the reproductive structures. So then there's probably a circle this big, and now there's a circle this big. And once it gets quite large, because I mean, some fungi can grow like acres and acres, um, then it would put mushrooms up all on its ends, but you wouldn't be able to see the circle anymore because it's so spread out that you wouldn't realize that they're all in a, you know, one fungus. So that's what you would know that the, if the fungus started, that's the oldest part of the fungus was in the middle and the newest part um, is on the outside of those. And then the mushrooms will go away relatively quickly, but that doesn't mean the fungus is dead. It's just the fungus is underground. It just doesn't have its reproductive structures up anymore. So that's mostly what I have for you for fungi. Don't forget to look at those videos about the chytrids, about the biofabrics, about the... Um, um, just a general, uh, the polobolus and its dispersal method and all that kind of stuff, they're on a page on uh, online.